Hey folks, welcome to another episode of the Wrench Turners podcast, a show that's about improving the life, well-being, and productivity of mechanics everywhere. I am your host, Mr. Joshua Taylor, founder of WrenchTurners.online. Today we have another episode in our recruitment series. We've met a gentleman who's got a storied past. He's been around the block a few times and perhaps even over it, depending on the circumstances, and we're going to find about uh, about that a little bit more later. But he's a veteran, a leader, an entrepreneur, and a business owner, and recruitment uh, agency owner as well. His name is Nathan Lenahan. And without further ado, let's just get right into it. Nathan, thank you very much for taking a few minutes this evening and, and uh, having a chat with us. Heck yeah. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. So, so Nathan, we were just saying there before we got into it here, you've, you've got a long history of work that I wouldn't necessarily have put two and two together. When you see things like Army, and then Lockheed Martin, that doesn't necessarily look like the same thing. Because typically I, as A, as a Canadian, and B, as somebody who is not in, not a veteran either, as well as not knowing how all that works, I immediately go, Army, why are you working for a plane company? That makes no sense to me. So before we get into the deep deepness of that, um, tell us what got you into what you're doing now? What was, what's the reason, you know, what got into you to recruitment? What got you into those kinds of things? What was the reason? Yeah, I think yeah, uh, it's I think been the, like the culmination of a career. Like I've been meeting and connecting people with opportunities my whole career. And now I actually get to charge for it, which is kind of fun. So, you know, everything from, I just love helping people find the next step in their life. And I've done that so informally for so many years. Uh, when I started telling people, hey, I'm thinking about recruiting, everyone was just like, oh my gosh, that is that is the right step. I can't believe you haven't done that before and, and you actually get paid for it. So I think that's pretty cool. Awesome. Okay, so informally doing it for a long time. So let's let's go back to the beginning then. So your career didn't start in recruitment. Your your career, as it were, looks like it might've started right into the army as at a young age. Is, would that be correct? It is. So I have a, I have a twin brother. His name's uh, Nicholas Lenahan. He's actually been on your show as well. And uh, he is technically the older one and he joined the army right out of high school. I had no desire to do that, but we come from a military family and I figured I was going to serve as well. Uh, my first semester of college, 9-11 happened. And I might've been getting in a little trouble at college as well. So decided, Hey, let's go ahead and kill a couple, a uh, couple birds, one stone, and let's go do my service and uh, straighten me out a little bit. And ultimately, end up starting a family very young as well, um, which is really cool. Four kids, tw you know, over twenty-two years of marriage. But uh, I followed my brother's example, and I joined the army and uh, and and jumped in, and I loved it. I really did. I did six years active, and and from there, I knew I wanted to go back and finish that degree. So I'm really big on finishing those things I started. And it only took me 10 years to finish that dang degree um, the first time around. But uh, I'm proud I went back to the same school and finished. Um, really quick side story on that. Like I was hating my transition from the army back to school, being kind of that weird older veteran in class and everything. And uh, I managed to talk my way into a, a full scholarship working for the football team. And we were like a top 25 football team at the time and, uh, and kind of found my place again after the army, which was really cool. Um, mm -hmm. and then from that, that's where I ended up at Lockheed Martin, right after I finished my degree, went to Lockheed Martin. It's, uh, one of the largest, um, employers in the world. It's a defense contractor. And regardless of what the name is on the building, like 96% mm -hmm. of their, you know, 50 billion in revenue comes from the U S government. So you work for the U S government and they actually built the things they use in the army. So you can see, you can even see like some of these, like uh, little rocket launchers and stuff in the background here. Um, Lockheed Martin built those. So I'm like, oh. This is cool. Like it'd be a cool place to go. Big brand name. People think it's cool. And honestly, I freaking hated it. It was an uh, incredible company, but just wasn't a good fit for me because I like trying new things. I like breaking things. I like, I like moving fast. And that just wasn't uh, necessarily the right fit there. Gotcha. Gotcha. I, I understand you know, one, of, one of my good friends, Corey Smith, says he's, he's great at breaking things, not so good at putting things back together. So I can understand the, I can understand the enjoyment there. I can understand it. Yeah, Nick was, it's, it's interesting how, as networking goes, how people have two completely separate paths, as it were, but not all at the same time. You know, he spent a lot of time, you know, in, in 
HD. He's he's led business and so on and so forth himself and in, in his own on on his own now. And like the, the cool things of meeting people and how their careers progress and what the end result is, is really cool in a lot of ways. But the challenge is, you know, there's a number of technicians that I've, I've had the opportunity to coach that, you know, one of the things they say to me, especially in initial consultations is when they say, it's like, what else do I have to do? Like, I'm, I'm a mechanic. What else can I do? It's like, brother, there is so much you can do with the skills you learn turning wrenches, just the problem solving, just like all of those things. And then you see outside of that world and in, in the folks that are, that are in the vendor space now that have had the, the opportunity to speak with and maybe even record with some of them on the show and go, you know, their career paths when some of them, they started in automotive in some way, shape or form, whether it was selling or, or back in service or parts or whatever, the, what have you, how their careers have developed, taking them outside uh, the dealership in some places and, and staying within it, but in completely different roles down the road. It's, it's interesting how, how, how that works. So you were, you got in there, you, you army and then out the army, Lockheed Martin. And, and so where in there did your, during your career there, now this is this is going back a ways, I think, for you. Where in there started that transition to informally recruiting, as it were? Yeah, I, I think um, when I left uh, and, and went to Lockheed Martin, I actually got into this thing called an operations leadership development program. So it's uh, it is part of the responsibility is to try and find like that next class of. OLDPs, like these leadership participants. And so every year I'd go back to my university and, and do a big, you know, public speaking event, do an event, hold it and, and recruit there. I'd go back to the military bases, uh, especially Fort Hood in Texas. I'd recruit there as well. And then I just became kind of a, a person people reached out to. So whether it's helping with, uh, you know, interviewing skills, reviewing resumes. I just got a whole bunch of new resumes recently from people that didn't even know I had a recruiting business. And, you know, it's just, it's just something that I always enjoyed helping people with. And, okay. uh, and I felt like I did pretty well on my own. So uh, yeah, it's just kind of come naturally. And then I'll say one other thing in the army, uh, the best leader I ever had, his name was Edgar Fuentes. He came in, he's like this fiery Puerto Rican, came in in the middle of uh, my tour to Iraq. And uh, from the day he arrived, uh, he, he, he liked me and he was always recruiting me and he'd come from being an army recruiter. And he's, he's like, the one thing you'll learn is you're always recruiting, always, 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 always recruiting. And, uh, in the army, you don't necessarily get to pick your team, but he always managed to figure out like, how do I get these puzzle pieces where I want them? And so I've been thinking that same way ever since I met him and not only for myself, but helping others. Every time I meet someone like that guy, that person's going to be on my team one day. I don't know when or where, but I'm going to find a spot because that person's awesome. And I want to work. Awesome. Awesome. So you're always recruiting and this is, this is going back before you were formally doing it. Yep. So what, what was the reason that you transitioned from doing it informally to formally? And, and I'm, I'm asking this because there's a line that some people cross and they don't, and it becomes kind of like that, that no man's zone that no, that, don't know what to do. You're at a point where, you know, 10 to 15 years into doing something. And I don't have data outside of, of mechanics right now to support this. It's just kind of my gut is that you do something for 10 to 15 years and you get to a point where maybe you've changed places where you work a couple of times trying to find the right fit. And it doesn't feel like you're going to find the right fit. Quick segue, 80, 20 rule when you're moving around. 80% of the time, it's not going to be the greatest fit. It's not going to be a great place. It's not going to be a great boss, whatever the case may be. It means essentially you need to move five times. It's not how the math works, but fundamentally it means you got to move five times to find a place you fit. And you think if, if the average person is moving jobs every two years, that means eight years in, you're going on to your fifth move. How many people are truly making that fifth move to another shop to think, ah, it's just, it's not worth it. This is in the industry for me. When in all likelihood, you're just possibly not finding the right fit. So that, that 10, eight, 10 to 15 year block I'm seeing, especially on my survey, because the average, average age and average time in trade is coming way down. Um, we're seeing an, uh, an influx of people leaving early. 
because they don't necessarily know that they want to do this anymore. It's hard, you know, the constant changes, constant process changes or warranty changes or boss changes or whatever the case may be. And they, it's like this, maybe I should go to a different industry. Do you have that? Did you, did you have that kind of moment where you didn't really know whether you should be doing what you're doing anymore? And then that's why you went and doubled down on recruiting. Uh, it's a little bit like that. I think, you know, for me, when I left Lockheed Martin, uh, I jumped in and I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to start my own company. And so I did, uh, I actually started mm -hmm. while I was at Lockheed. I moved to a midnight shift, like overnight shift. And I worked from, you know, 4 PM to 3 AM Monday through Thursday at Lockheed Martin in, in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. And at 7 a.m., I was up working on my business and I built a property management business and I was uh, flipping houses. And so, you know, like that started the entrepreneurship piece for me, trying to figure out what that next step was. Uh, we did pretty well. We sold that company in about 18 months and I went on to a really fast growing startup where I had really specific criteria if I was going to go work for a company again of what I wanted to learn and what did I want out of that. And so, you know, for me, the three things were like, I wanted to manage a profit and loss statement. I wanted to manage uh -huh. teams across multiple markets and, uh, and I wanted to be able to hire and fire. And so, you know, in, in this, this company that I went to, uh, you know, we work, it's actually, it's pretty well known among, um, you know, business people. But, you know, when I started my little region had like three or 4 million in revenue and I don't know, 15 people, 20 people, maybe. Mm -hmm. And when I left three years later, we had like 400 people, 200 million plus in revenue. And, you know, you just got to be a part of something that I had never been a part of before, you know, the growth. And I loved it. I hired hundreds of people. And then the, the job after that, I hired like 800 people in two years. And so I've gotten, you know, over the last six, seven years, 1200 plus people I've hired, you know, for different roles. And so when I say like the recruiting is kind of built on itself, uh, both formally and informally along the way, like that's all led to this. And so um, I went from there to buying companies. So we bought uh, an air conditioning company here in Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, very, very small. And so while I hoped to work in it, I worked in it for a while. It just wasn't big enough to support me and the other owners. And so at some point I'm like, okay, well, do I go get a job or mm -hmm. do I start a company? And that was the genesis of my recruiting company. And honestly, like mm -hmm. I just started it by jumping on Twitter, asked a few questions to people on Twitter, and I ended up with like 50 sales calls from it. Um, and so, yeah, I created a whole business and every single person in pers uh, and yeah, every single role that I have placed in the last, you know, like nine or 10 months have all come from Twitter. That's very cool. That is very cool. Twitter, it sounds like Twitter being used to its most uh, fullest that's not even the right grammar for that, but the fullest potential that you could possibly use a platform, you're being social and being able to curate business from it. That's, I think that's a dream of every social platform, quite honestly, building relationships and somehow making money off of it all at the same time. That's awesome. So 1,200 people in a short period of time of hire and fire gives you a lot of ammunition to be able to go out into the, the marketplace to, be, to become a recruiter very quickly right away because you've got a lot of experience of, of that hiring process of what worked, what didn't work, you know, what characteristics fit, what role and so on and so forth in multiple different markets, because, you know, people tell me on a regular basis, Oh, you're, you're curating survey data from all these dealerships and you know, none of them are saying, well, you're right. You're absolutely right. You know, Dallas Fort Worth is not the same marketplace as Chicago. It's just not. They're both metropolises and, and they have lots of urban areas around them. And then rural areas, you go out far enough and some people still call it Chicago and some people don't. Same thing with Dallas Fort Worth. You've got metropolis, you've got rural, you're urban, and then you've got rural. So you've got to play the game a little bit differently depending on you, how you look at it. But when I look at survey data at the end of the day, you look at dealerships. I'm only looking at American uh, dealerships right now. I'm not looking at independents. I'm not looking at e uh, HD yet. I will be, but not yet. I want to get a, a nice bucket of automotive folks in the dealership space to get me going. Um, and then we're going to start branching out, but that's the focus right now. But what I'm seeing is irrespective of rural, urban, or, or metro, the only things that really change on my survey is income. That's it. Everything else is about tit for tat same. 
Like I just, uh, I just redid all my data because I'm up to, a, I'm just shy of, of 500 technician surveys that the, the, the one year or less, the, sorry, the level one or less, the level two, the level three and the level three plus the, the, the technical training of those three and then the subsequent results across the rest of the questions of the survey, they start to line up. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter urban, rural, or or metropolis. It doesn't matter. The only thing that really changes in income, and even then, it doesn't really change that much. The only things that really change the income that I can see thus far, again, sample size is, is still very small, but the only thing that really changes is whether it's everybody or luxury. That's it. Interesting. That's about it. And the, the luxury stores, um, they have a much higher base or a much higher um, wage per hour. But most of them, most of them don't make nearly as much as say a high volume import store will. Like the Toyota and Honda, Honda technicians by far and away, if it's a properly run shop, with with all of the resources and tools and leadership that they need to succeed, most like three plus uh, your level three plus trained technicians are like 150,000 a year plus. Some of them knocking on 200k. There aren't any luxury, at least that have submitted on the survey thus far. There aren't any luxury that are knocking on 200k. But their average, and this is the biggest difference, their average is way higher. So if you uh, give you give you an example specifically, I know you've probably got your own data after doing 1,200 hire and fires, but you don't necessarily have it for technicians because I know we'll get that into the, into what it is that you're recruiting here in a second. But you know when you see an average store do say fifty one thousand dollars a year, so that's all the technicians. You got 20, 25, 30 technicians, and the average at the end of the day is fifty one thousand. If I if, say for a Chevy store or, or a Ford store, if I go to like a Benz or a BMW, their average is like 78, 80, somewhere in there as their average. So it means even their apprentices or their loop technicians, their average starting is way higher. It's just way higher. Makes sense. So it, it kind of makes sense. But then you look at things like, um, I'm going down a, a rabbit hole here a bit, folks, but when you look at Honda stores and Toyota stores that are knocking on $200 an hour door rate, like $199.95, $190, 195 the luxury stores are really only $220, $240. Like we're not an insane – it's not like it's $100 more an hour. That's the, when you go to like Lamborghini and stuff like that, you hear about door rates at like $300 an hour and so on and so forth. I, I understand that. They're doing super low volume. It's like they have all of the same uh, tools and equipment as a Honda store would, but they do one car every couple of days, not one car every couple hours. Yep. Right? It's a completely different business model in that in that sense. So taking that back, taking that back. So I'm talking about automotive you're not in specifically the automotive space. In fact, it's only that's only a very small, slim thing that you could do. But your focus, more specifically, as is trades as a whole. I love your. You got to say your tagline for everybody. Uh, smooth operators. Is that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you've got. I say. Uh, um, what is? How does? How does it phrase? We hire. For the sweaty jobs. Oh, oh, okay, okay. All right, I was just trying to make sure I understood. Yeah, yeah. Um, we, so we focus on blue collar industries and uh, and or blue collar businesses and sweaty trades, you know. And so, just you know, people that work for a living, put their hands on things, make things, build things, repair things. Um, so automotive, logistics, skilled trades, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, um, manufacturing, like the the heart of America. Um, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I focus on. Awesome. The, the sweaty trades. Okay. That's, that's what I was looking for. That's what I was looking for. So the hiring for the sweaty trades now, because you, and this is a little bit different because we, gonna, I think there's a couple of recruiters before you that focus specifically on automotive, um, whether it's from the house, back of the house, it doesn't matter, but because you're in working with m many trades, but people who touch things, build things, fix things, so on and so forth. What is like one of the m most major similarities between them all in terms of the hiring and firing process that you've had to deal with? 
Well, I think the nice thing is, is there's, there's typically some level of benchmark in the industry, right? There's norms of, Hey, this is the pay range. These are the expectations and trying to figure out if, if it's a match for who, you know, the technician or, or skilled person is and for the company. Right. And I think that really comes down to, you know, things that you're talking about, like, if you don't know who you are as a person and what you're searching for next, it makes it really hard to find that, you know, that 20%, right. That one out of the next five to be successful. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's the same thing for us. Like we own an HVAC company and we really struggled recruiting in the beginning because we didn't define and truly know who we are. Um, and like some of that's the, you know, stuff that people may or may not resonate with like a mission and values. But when, what I really mean is like, do we have a compensation structure that makes sense? That's super easy for guys to understand how much money they could make uh, based on how they performed in the past. You know, do they mm -hmm. know uh, that they can actually take time off and not get a whole bunch of shit for it? Do they know that we have healthcare that we, we, you know, uh, we help subsidize so they can take care of their families. Do they know that they get weekends off or are they only doing on call once you know, every other month or, or so. And so I think it really became about building those things and knowing who we were as a company. And I think it's the same thing for the, the other side is like, I don't think mechanics or electricians or any of these skilled people really know how much opportunity is out there. Like there are so many opportunities. And I, the best ex, uh, explanation I give is my degree was facility and property management. So essentially it was like a fancy construction management degree with a little more finance and like numbers. But the best part of it is I got to go do every single thing. So like if we learned how to size a giant steel I-beam for a building, well, guess what? Like we were going to install an I-beam and I'm like, I had a house at the time. I put a 22 foot steel I-beam in the bottom and basement of my house and took out this load bearing wall is the craziest crap I've ever done. Um, so much so when we sold the house, like we had basements, this is in Utah. And so like I carved out this U-shaped like a uh, hole in the basement, like the top of the basement wall. So I could get that uh -huh. I-beam through because it's like a 1200 pound I-beam trying to get it across the, the the basement into the place I was going to. So when they, the people that bought it inspected the house, they're like, what's this weird shaped hole on the top of your foundation wall here? Like what, what's going on here? I'm like, you know, that awesome freaking family room that you have, that's like 24 by 24. Well, that's because I put a steel I-beam in there. So and can and combine two rooms and now it's an awesome room. And so, uh, um, but I got to learn all those things. And so I have this real soft spot for, you know, people that are doers that are willing to do it. And so even at Lockheed Martin, I was a facility manager. My whole team was, you know, mechanics and uh, industrial electricians and electricians working on like five, 10, $50 million manufacturing machines. Uh, and, and like, you know, my building that I ran or uh, led for facility managers, like a mile long crazy and we built the the joint stealth fighter like the most advanced you know fighter jet in the world and and so getting to work like side by side with those guys just really built uh like my appreciation for these people but i got to see right after that like i have literally a hundred different directions i could go job wise i could go be another facility manager in manufacturing i could go i could go help build multifamily apartments. I could go start a property management company like an idiot and, uh, you know, and flip houses. Like th there's like all, there's so many different things. There's a million jobs in real estate, just like there's a million jobs. If you know, technical, like there's really cool companies like manufacturing robotics, like all this stuff's coming. They're, they're reshoring it. It's coming back to America. And there are really cool companies out there where you don't, aren't necessarily going to be hurting your body to to get that next dollar an hour raise or knowing that the only thing that you can sell is another hour of your time because that's all you're selling in any kind of shop right like you only have a finite number of hours per person so that's and that's where a lot of folks think that that it it stagnates at and that's and that's a challenge for me because there's a lot of opportunities you know team lead leadership is a big deal like the opportunity to lead in a shop is is a is a big deal and i don't think a lot of folks turning wrenches right now know. I don't think you guys know how much opportunity there is to lead. And just because you want, here's the, the caveat to that, just because you want to lead doesn't mean that you can. So there's a lot that you, that you need to learn to do it successfully. So it's really cool that, you know, finding the, the, C, the, the key comparables across the trades that allowed you to use the same similar tactics for hiring and firing that you did at Lockheed Martin now in your own recruiting business. So what were the, what are the, now that we've, we've heard a little bit about the similarities and, you know, some of the things that, that people can do 
outside of the trade. What are the, some of the challenges that you've come across and then perhaps solutions you came up with once dealing with placements, shall we say? So you've got a technician, um, you've got them in your, in your process, you found a store that's, that's looking for a technician or vice versa. You've now placed the individual at the store. What are some of the challenges from a recruitment standpoint that you come across after placement? Yeah, I think there's, uh, in, in recruitment, I mean, it's just sales. That, that's what it is. And I think really having a great discovery process with whoever's hiring to try and understand the very best that you can, what they operate like. And I think it, the hardest part is when I understood it to be one thing and then I place that person and they're like, man, this leader seemed really cool when I interviewed. And I've been, now I've been here for a month and they don't really talk to me. They're not investing in me. I don't even know what the heck's going on. And so I just go do what I think I'm supposed to do and that's it. And then I feel like I failed my job because I missed that or I sold something that, you know, uh, didn't feel like a one-to-one, -one, you know, uh, mm -hmm. like understanding, right? Like, here's what I understood it to be. Here's what I sold it to you as. And it is a lot of those things still, but it's, it's also different. And, and so like, you can't it's really hard to have those details when you're not part of the organization. So like, that's the hardest part is you come in and ideally you have a long-term relationship with these, you know, the hiring managers or the, the companies that are partnering with you, but that's not always the case. And oftentimes I'm doing one-offs and, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to get as deep as you want and know, Hey, this is the culture you're going to deal with. Like there's some bullshit you're going to deal with. That's normal. But is it the stuff that you can put up with or is it the stuff that you're like, hey, I said the last time I will not ever do this again. You know, and so I think mm -hmm. just truly understanding what the needs are of, of the technician and what the needs are of, of the company and making sure those are a good fit. Because I won't say I've got, gotten any completely wrong, but I've definitely missed on, on some of those where uh, it was sold as something different to me, despite how hard I pushed on details. And some of those people just don't want to give details. They just like, hey, just go hire. You're supposed to be the expert at this. Just go find me another you know, level three mechanic or, or whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. And you're like, well, like, tell me about the business. Like, are you guys growing? Like, how are you retaining people? How, like, are the people happy? You know, why are they happy? How long have you been a leader there? You know, how are you investing in these people? What's the growth path over the next three years or five years? Are there opportunities for growth? Are there more than one shift? Like, does it mean if you want to grow to be a, you know, foreman or a supervisor or whatever, you have to go to another shift, you know? And so like just learning those things and, and understanding the road, uh, like the, the barriers and what people want on both sides is really important. And it's really hard to get it right consistently. Awesome. And I, the cool thing there is, and I appreciate this a lot, is that you listed like 12 questions that a technician who isn't using a recruiter uh, for on, on behalf of them to, to find a shop those are great questions to ask a potential leader. Like, what does the growth of this business look like? Do you do you have a um, getting a feedback? Like, do you have an asinine thirty percent year over year gross profit uh, target, or do you have uh, an actual manageable ta target of say, you know, it's an eight per we're expecting an eight percent growth year over year based on this reason, this reason, and this reason, and you know, what is your current uh, labor mix and um, you know, how many work orders are you doing a day and how many you projected to do next year and three years down the road, like get very tactical and specific with those questions because they can really help suss out whether the leader you're talking to is worth your time. Because in reality, like I said, 80% of the time, you're not going to find a fit and maybe the leader's awesome, but maybe they're still hamstrung. And I, and I think uh, Nathan shared early on, when he decided on that role, I think you were deciding on the role to, to start at WeWork when you had your non-negotiables, right? Yep. You wanted to hire and fire. You wanted to be responsible for VNL, and and most importantly, most importantly, you needed to see the whole picture. You need to be able to hire and fire. Now, a good leader, a, sorry, a great leader, a high value leader is going to have those things. They're going to be able, your service manager is going to be able to do those things somebody who's trying to be a high value leader, but is in a, in a facility that's, that's hamstrung in, in some capacity, they're not going to be able to make decisions to effectively, so to be able to effectively affect your day. Like if they don't have authority and autonomy to make decisions, it, their day is 
as stressful as yours and you're not getting the things you need and they're not getting the things they need either. So asking really great questions like that, get really deep, really specific. Those kinds of things can really help you make, make decisions and awesome. I really appreciate that. So sure. one of those things, a couple of things kind of came up in there. The first thing that came to mind is that array of questions off the top of your head tells me that in all likelihood, you very much know what you're doing. Um, cause obviously I haven't experienced your actual recruitment process. Um, but we're trying to suss some of those things out for, for these mechanics. What would you say is, is one piece of advice that isn't asking great questions like that, that you would suggest that a mechanic should know in order to determine whether they're working with a top tier recruiter. Number one, I think it's, it's understanding or asking them. Uh, is this a role that they have recruited before and do they understand what's different about it from other roles or industries? You know, and so, mm -hmm. and if, if it's new, like, it's just a little bit different, right? It's just, like each industry is a little bit different. While I think there's lots of comparisons between, you know, like an HVAC technician and uh, a retail automotive technician or you know, mechanic versus even, a, mm -hmm. you know, an 18 wheeler diesel mechanic. There's still lots of nuances between those, and so either uh, they have the experience, or do they have someone that they're they're talking to or referencing to actually have you know, deep insights? So, like if I were going to a uh, you know a heavy wheel mechanic or eighteen you know like diesel repair mechanic, I have a twin brother who's an expert in that. That's exactly who I'm talking to. Number one, mm -hmm. and if if they are willing to admit what they don't know, then I think you probably have a decent recruiter. Um, and if they tell you who they, they're willing to go to, to learn or ask the questions when they don't know, then you have an even better recruit. Because if they, they think it's all the same, like recruiting at its, its foundation is very similar, but it is the nuance and like the expertise in each industry that makes you different. And so, uh, so I just say like, Hey, do you actually know what you're talking about in this industry? You know, tell me about, tell me a story where you had success with someone else and, and why was it successful? And then. Um, and if you don't know, like, who do you talk to if you don't know about this, uh, this industry or this role, like who would you get information from? So I think it's relatively simple, awesome. but, um, and do they prep you? So that's the other thing is just making sure that if they like you, they are like, we are working our tail off to make sure you're successful. Like the incentives mm -hmm. matter a lot. So like, that's the one other thing I'll say, and this is just my advice for everything. Do you understand the incentives that are in play in this situation? So you talked about like, is uh -huh. it a good, is it a good leader at, uh, or is this wor leader worth my salt? And so I'd ask you like, most people are worried about what am I getting paid and how am I getting paid? I would ask you also to ask, what is your leader getting paid and how are they getting paid and how successful have they been? Because if 50% of their compensation comes from bonuses and they haven't hit bonus the last three years, and they're just raising the the uh the goal every single year like moving the goal post and making it super hard well guess who they're going to grind to try and finally hit that bonus they're going to grind you and they're going to mm -hmm. grind too and you you know that's a potential for turnover right so if you were to ask a hiring manager hey uh you know what was this goal this last year or this last quarter did you guys hit it how hard was it on the team to hit that you know and start like trying to get a little bit of that information out of them uh it's really really powerful to see what you learn um, interesting. I, then, I, I, you know, I, I know that some people would think to ask that, but I don't know whether they actually would. And I, and now that I think about it, it's a great question to ask because it's, I've had these conversations and we're actually co having a conversation somewhat similar to this in the uh, not so distant past. We were talking about compensation specifically for, for shop foreman. Now shop foreman can be working, not working. Shop foreman can be uh, bonused based on the team. They can have all kinds of different bonuses. And it was probably Joe Chambers that probably brought up having a CSI component to a bonus uh, of a shop foreman. And I politely disagreed that um, unless a shop foreman is customer facing, unless they have an active engagement process with customers regularly, I don't want to see a CSI bonus on a foreman. I don't want to see a, an expense uh, tied bonus in some capacity. And that includes expense can be gross profit exp uh, based uh, bonus. It can be anything where them getting things fixed or rectified for the team hurts their bonus. That, that just if if their role is to help the team, helping the team shouldn't negatively affect their ability to make a bonus. 
That to me just makes no sense. Unfortunately, I see regularly in in bonus structures when I go on Indeed or, or I hear about it from from a mechanic friend who's like, hey, I'm I'm going for the shop foreman role. Um, this is what they presented me as as the opportunity before I go in for an interview. This is just kind of the basics. And I see gross profit based bonus. It's like, oh my goodness, you're a shop foreman, you're not working. There it just means that they're gonna say, Oh, your your gross profit super low this month. Yeah, we had to fix 15 tools. Yeah, well, I guess you're not making bonus this month. It's like, like, and and then you see the compensation structure where half of their income should come from bonus. And they tie the bonus to gross profit. I'm sorry, folks, for any of the leaders out there that are listening that happen to even think that this is okay. I'm sorry. It's just anxiety waiting to happen. That person's just going to exit faster than you can shake a stick, right? We don't want expense-based shop foreman bonuses. But- Service managers, on the other hand, service manager, on the other hand, it should be because um, you have to have both sides of that coin, in my opinion. But knowing and and as a as a mechanic asking an interview, you know, how are you paid? I don't need to know how much you make, but how are you paid? Are you tied to expense? Are you tied? How are you bonused? And, and do you make bonus? Like, how does that work? And, you know, what's, you know, if our what's our door rate? Well, if the door rate's $200, well, what's the effective labor rate? You know, just being able to elicit that kind of response, they should be able, the service manager should be able to be snappy with it. Oh well, it's a hundred and it's a hundred and thirty dollars. Wait, your effective labor rate's a hundred and thirty, and your door rate's two hundred. Something, something's not right. Something's not right. Um, because then you have business possible, you know, probable business challenges by the leadership. They don't necessarily know how to lead from a business uh, sense. They're not business savvy. Or something of that nature. So great questions. I appreciate that very much. Appreciate that very much. Those yeah. are interesting things to ask. Uh, now, just on that really quickly, okay. um, to, and to tie that back to the recruiter, you know, and, and what does it make a good recruiter? If you understand the incentives for me, is I only get paid if you start, and I only continue to get paid if you're there for ninety days. Otherwise, I got to go find someone new, or I don't get paid. And so it is in my best interest to find someone that's going to be a great fit. And that's just a personal thing too. Like I have a lot of, you know, if I'm going to put my name, my name's kind of unique, uh, last name, Linehan, it's not very common. And we take a lot of pride in having a name that stands for something. And so we want to put someone awesome in there. And so if someone doesn't work out, like it breaks my heart and I feel like a failure. And so we don't want that, but I do not get paid unless they've been there you know, started their job and been there for 90 days, I don't get to keep that money. And so huge incentive to get it right for them and also right for the client. Awesome. Tied, and again, it's performance, right? And more specifically, it's fit. It's your ability to find the fit, right? It, it matters, the square peg in the round hole. I realize if you decrease the size of the square, it'll go through a round hole, but that's mod Making it work and making it fit are not the same, necessarily the same things at all times, right? Yeah. Uh, as every mechanic knows, enough lube and enough hammering and just about everything will go in. Or if, if it's liquid, of course, it's going to be tight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So in, in that regard, you know, your processes, some of them are going to be longer, some of them are shorter, depending on the role. Obviously, if you're trying to hire uh, um, uh, entry or mid-level technician or entry mid-level anything, you know, the likelihood that you can get everything started and finished and done inside of, you know, 30, 60 days is pretty high. But on the flip side is if you're looking for like a level three or you're looking for somebody with 15 years in or you're looking for, you know, a service manager or a GM, you're going to be a lot more hard pressed to get it done in a short period of time because in all likelihood, you're going to have you know two or three interviews, not one or two. You're going to have multiple bits and pieces. So in your recent history, have you had, it doesn't matter whether it's a mechanic or not, but someone who's in that same kind of sweaty job transitioned to a leadership role that you've done the recruitment for? And can you walk us through that process a little bit? So just make sure I understand the question. Um, anyone that had, like I've recruited someone moving from that like mechanic or skilled expert to a leadership role. Yes. 
Uh, the best one I have, I don't have one super recent that has been the result of my recruit, uh, like recruiting company, but I do have one, a story where, you know, our HVAC company that we bought, uh, we did have a very mm -hmm. skilled HVAC technician um, that came with the company. He's an army veteran, super, super smart, and, uh, and just has a great attitude, always willing to listen, always willing to be coached and, uh, and pushes back on the things that matter that especially, you know, at ethically value wise, like, Hey, here's what my values are. I want to be honest. I want to feel like, you know, this is, you know, how, how things should be done. We always take care of the customer. And, and so, uh, when we came in, we were a super small company and we, we sat down with them and I do this thing called, uh, I didn't do it as formal with him, but, you know, creating a growth plan. And, you know, I literally have like this big templated deck to go through and ask all these questions of, you know, roles that you might be interested in. What do you like most about your job now? Uh, you know, what do you want that to look like in the future? How much money do you want to make? Like, what does that look like? You know, why do you want to make that much money? You know, is there something you're going after or just trying to, you know, is there, is there like a mountain you're trying to climb and just trying to understand like what's that path and then helping give them kind of the breadcrumbs of how they get there. Right. And so, uh, we sat down with this, with, uh, this technician and said, here's the path in the next 15 months. So basically a little over a year from now, we want to, before we go into uh, second quarter, which is our busy season, HVAC, air conditioning, like in Texas, mm -hmm. before bu busy season, we'd love for you to be a service manager. We want to promote you. Uh, this is not a promise. This is a path here. If you walk that path and we hit the goals that we have to together, we will promote you. And here's what that's going to look like. And so uh, that's all we had to do. And he took care of the rest. And so it's really nice where he, you know, he'd ask questions, he would step up wherever he needed. And he's just the kind of person you, you hope you get. And, and so for us, he's been a service manager uh, now for a year and he's doing a great job. He's continuing to learn. He's continuing to be coached. Now he's coaching us on things. And, uh, and some of the things that he thought he learned of like, Hey, you know, in a, in an auto shop, you say door rate, you know, our, for us, hourly labor rate, like similar things like, mm -hmm. hey, it might cost this much when we bought the business well, with inflation and everything else. And then us elevating kind of the experience, um, elevating the promises that we make and keep like that price has gone up. And so now uh, he would have a year ago, he would have balked at that big time. And now he's saying like, hey, now I understand why we're doing that, because even in the shittiest circumstances where we really don't want to make something right and we're. 100% in the right for not making it right. We still go make it right. You know, even mm -hmm. if like, even if a customer is just straight up wrong, we still go make it right. And we, we charge enough to keep our promises. And that has been a huge learning experience for all of us together. But um, keeping that promise to him, like we provided the path and he walked it. And so it was that easy. And now he's doing awesome in his role. And so that's what I love is just having an opportunity to help other people reach their goals and do things that they want to. Uh, and so now he's not on the field as much. He's still in the field some, but, uh, you know, a huge, huge goal for him. And, and we can reach it. So that's awesome. And there's, there's like three really big mic drops in there. First and foremost, you have an entire growth plan. Growth plan. Doesn't necessarily need to be called development plan. Doesn't need to be called a career path. A growth plan. You growing you. And it's written and you have a whole document dedicated to asking questions to get them to determine their own next steps. And then you presented a goal line. I've got this field goal as service manager. This is what the service manager role looks like. These are the all rules, responsibilities, authority, autonomy, so on and so forth that come accustomed to a service manager role. In all likelihood, because you're in agreement, you can also say these are the accomplishments that are being rewarded uh, numerically as such. Um, you meet those goals along the way. That's what we want to see. So between now and then, these are the things that we need you to accomplish, whether it be schooling, education, training, whatnot, between now and then that you need to accomplish. It's not a promise. You deliver on your end. This is what happens, right? It's a path, the growth path. I really love that. That's big number one. Big number two is that you aren't just saying stuff. Obviously, you've built enough trust with this individual, short period or not, for them to go, okay, they've made a, a, 
not a promise, but a path, a pathway for me. And now I'm going to deliver on it because I trust that you're actually going to deliver on it. And number three, kind of the really cool one here is you charge enough to make it right. Let that sink in for a second, folks, because a lot, I see a lot of dealerships door rates when I do as doing the survey. And just as a quick pause, folks, if you don't know your dealership's door rate, that's on you. And believe me when I say you don't know what the door rate is because 88% of you don't know the door rate of the shop that you're working at. 88% of you don't know the door rate of the shop you're working at. That means basically 9 out of 10. And several of the shops in the survey are 10 technician shops, which means one person in the shop knows what the door rate is. Right? So let, we're, we're having a good chuckle here, but it, it sh we shouldn't be laughing because this is not something that we should be talking about. You need to know what your door rate is. And the reason why that's really important in this particularly long segue is that technicians, we are the biggest billboard for the dealership there is. 10 let's say the shop is 10 techs that's 10 voices talking about where you work if you're doing nothing but bash where you work and you don't know what the door rate is guess whose fault that there's nobody coming to the door we are just as much to blame for a lot of cars coming to the door as we are with no cars coming to the door if a, if a store has been nothing but shit people in the shop for years, it doesn't matter how great the brand or the store operates. They're going to get a bad name. I'm not saying it's us all the time, but I'm definitely saying it's us contributing. So know your door rates, folks. Get out and know your door rate. So charging enough to make it right. This is where some leaders are going to go, yep, that makes sense. Just make it right. That's that's customer service. That's customer experience. That's elevating it to where people want to come back. People want to want to come back. We don't like change. We get, you know, go through all of the anxiety inducing process of going online and trying to shop for a place to take our car. Then you finally get there on an appointment and you meet some new person that you've never met before in all likelihood because there's no sales to service handoff for the most part. And then you have this likely young 20 something who doesn't know shit from shit trying to do a walk around the car trying to describe something they know nothing about and in all likelihood have had a ipad thrust in front of them going here go sell and they have no knowledge of the shop they have no knowledge of how to sell and they have only hopefully a little bit of customer service skill and you still don't know what you're doing so let's make it right as best as we possibly can because these people they don't want to find a new nerd they don't want to find a new service drive person. It's so anxiety inducing to begin with it. Even as a person from the industry, I would love to go back to the same place every time and deal with the same people every time, but I can't, yep. I just, I just can't because rotation happens so much. I haven't seen the same service advisor in years in years. So off my high horse, I'm sorry, off my high horse. I'm sorry. I got one more question here for you, Nathan. Um, once in the store, doesn't matter whether it's a, a dealership or not, once a, a sweaty trade individual is at the facility that they're working at, they're inside the 90 days. You already uh, let us know that sometimes you miss something or something was omitted. Let's say that that's not the case. What are some of the common specific challenges? Maybe a, a, a construction worker or a plumber or a technician is as taxi you up. It's like, hey, um, this ain't right. What are you doing in that situation? I think it's always coming with uh, just the mentality of you know trying to understand. So just asking questions typically. Hey, you know, what, what do you mean by that? You know, it, like, how do you, how have you come to that conclusion? Um, how is that different than what you've experienced before? Does it seem intentional? Is that part of the culture? Is it just something we missed? Uh, and really trying to understand like their level of understanding first and, and maybe, 
you know, whatever baggage or bias they may have one way or the other towards that to try and get through. Cause like it, whatever they're telling you is most likely somewhere in between, you know, what they're saying and, you know, maybe what the company would say or the leader would say. And I think it's really, um, it's typically just most of the time being a, uh, an ear for them, you know, just to talk about and be frustrated with and, and, you know, share whatever they want. Uh, and very, very rarely does it ever come to where I actually reach out to the company and, and share something, you know, and so that can be, if it's, if it's ever escalated to a point where they're unhappy and they're not even willing to speak with them, uh, with the, with the company or the leadership, and I'm the one person that they, you know, they are willing to speak with and I'm happy to be a conduit for them, but that's, that's happened literally one time, um, you know, so far. And, uh, you know, and there has been certainly like moments where they're like, well, I don't know what I really signed up here for. And, uh, things mm-hmm. seem like they're going really well and now they're not. You know, and so, uh, you know, it's, it's for me first, it's making sure I try and retain any trust that I built, uh, and then just seek to understand, seek to understand, seek to understand and see how I get better for the next time. I like that. Seek to understand. You know, the phrase is usually seek, um, listen to understand, not to respond. And I think you shortened it much that I really like that. See, just seek to understand, Thanks. leave it at that. You don't even need to involve anything else into that, that statement. Just seek to understand. That's, that's awesome. I appreciate that. Well, Nathan, I really appreciate the time this evening. There's lots of golden nuggets in there. Um, thank you very much for your time, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on here. And, uh, yeah, I feel, feel honored to be on something that my brother got to be on too. So just trying to be like him. <laughs> well, uh, it, it wasn't because of him. It was because of him that I found you, but it wasn't initially, I had to speculate for a second. It's like, are they, are they, are they maybe, maybe they are. It's N Lenahan. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it's a different profile. Maybe, maybe Nick had created a fake profile so he could lurk. I don't know. And, and okay, I digress. That's kind of cool. Yeah, no, that's we're actually cool. twins, and I'm like six inches taller than him, though. Like we're like Danny DeVito, Arnold Schwarzenegger type <laughs> twins. <laughs> I'm definitely Arnold, just just to put it out there. So, gotcha, gotcha, Nathan. What are you doing? Is there anything that's coming up this year that you want to tell everybody about? Uh. Nothing that exciting. I mean, just tr- trying to build the smooth operators brand um, and recruiting for, you know, sweaty businesses and, and skilled trades and just trying to, I think, just leave a little imprint. The one thing I will say on this is every placement that we do, uh, it supports veterans and veteran spouses make the next step in their careers. And so uh, while we do not exclusively hire veterans, 65% of all my placements this year have been uh, veterans or veteran spouses. And so I think it's just really big for me to be able to give back to a community that's given so much to our country. And, and, uh, and honestly to myself, like I wouldn't be where I was without my time in the military and, and, uh, and my brother's time as well, like learning and, and uh, from him. And, you know, I come from a family there's probably 70 years of service between my brothers and my father. Uh, and so, mm-hmm. uh, so I would just love to leave that as a, a last you know, thought. And uh, I appreciate that. And anybody that's listening that happens to be a veteran and knows a veteran who might be looking for something, reach out to, to Nathan for sure. I know that Vernon Davis is, is deep into a comedy, B cars and, and C veterans. He's, you know, big in veteran suicide awareness, um, just helping veterans out in any way he possibly can. You know, folks, if you're listening right now, um, veterans, those two, Vernon Davis, big time, Nathan recruiting 65% of your placements this year, thus far are veterans. So um, we appreciate that reach out. It means that he's going to be able to speak your language a lot better, which also means that he's going to be able to understand you a lot better, which also means that the fit that he finds is going to be a lot likely to be better fit for you. So thank you very much for that folks. Thank you very much. Well, folks, I think that's going to be the end of today's episode. Uh, we do have a couple more coming. I'm not sure how many more. I haven't decided yet. I, I think I have more recorded than I need because um, I don't want to inundate you folks for, for months on end, but I want to get the good ones here. And I think Nathan is definitely one of those good ones thus far. Lots of great golden nuggets. Now, I really appreciate everybody that's gone on Wrench Turners and bought some merch. Thank you very, very much. Um, the support that's come through on the merch has has been awesome. I really appreciate every single last one of you. 
Um, the Wrenches for Wrenches newsletter continues to come out bi-weekly. Um, check out over to wrenchturners.online to subscribe to the premium uh, package where I put a whole bunch more tidbits than I do just on the stuff that goes out on LinkedIn bi-weekly. And as always, a quote to end. Um, I think it really exemplifies the conversation today, um, especially with the, the long history, the service, entrepreneurial spirit, the whole works. And the quote is, goes as this. Don't wish for it. Work for it. Love that. Folks, remember, pause, remember that negative pushes, positive pulls, and always clean your toys before you put them away.